Chapter Five of the Daughter of the Commandant by Alexander Pushkin, translated by Mrs. Milne Home. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kevin Davidson. Love. When I came to myself, I remained some time without understanding what had befallen me, nor where I chanced to be. I was in bed in an unfamiliar room, and I felt very weak indeed. Savielich was standing by me, a light in his hand. Some one was unrolling with care the bandages round my shoulder and chest. Little by little my ideas grew clearer. I recollected my duel and guessed without any difficulty that I had been wounded. At this moment the door creaked slightly on its hinges. "'Well, how is he getting on?' whispered a voice which thrilled through me. "'Always the same,' replied Savielich, sighing. "'Always unconscious, as he has been these four days.' I wished to turn, but I had not the strength to do so. "'Where am I? Who is there?' I said with difficulty. Maria Ivanovna came nearer to my bed and leaned over to me. "'How do you feel?' she said to me. "'All right, thank God,' I replied in a weak voice. "'Is it you, Maria Ivanovna? Tell me.' I could not finish. Savielich exclaimed— joy painted on his face he is coming to himself he is coming to himself oh thanks be to heaven my father pyotr andreitch have you frightened me enough four days that seems little enough to say but maria ivanovna interrupted him do not talk to him too much savielich he is still very weak she went away shutting the door carefully I felt myself disturbed with confused thoughts. I was evidently in the house of the commandant, as Maria Ivanovna could thus come and see me. I wished to question Savielich, but the old man shook his head and turned a deaf ear. I shut my eyes in displeasure and soon fell asleep. Upon waking I called Savielich, but in his stead I saw before me Maria Ivanovna, who greeted me in her soft voice. I cannot describe the delicious feeling which thrilled me at this moment. I seized her hand and pressed it in a transport of delight, while bedewing it with my tears. Maria did not withdraw, and all of a sudden I felt upon my cheek the moist and burning imprint of her lips. A wild flame of love thrilled through my whole being. "'Dear good Maria Ivanovna,' I said to her, "'be my wife. Consent to give me happiness.' she became reasonable again. "'For heaven's sake, calm yourself,' she said, withdrawing her hand. "'You are still in danger. Your wound may reopen. Be careful of yourself, were it only for my sake.' After these words she went away, leaving me at the height of happiness. I felt that life was given back to me. "'She will be mine. She loves me.' This thought filled all my being. From this moment I hourly got better. It was the barber of the regiment who dressed my wound, for there was no other doctor in all the fort, and, thank God, he did not attempt any doctoring. Youth and nature hastened my recovery. All the commandant's family took the greatest care of me. Maria Ivanovna scarcely ever left me. It is unnecessary to say that I seized the first favorable opportunity to resume my interrupted proposal, and this time Maria heard me more patiently. She naively avowed to me her love, and added that her parents would, in all probability, rejoice in her happiness. "'But think well about it,' she used to say. "'Will there be no objections on the part of your family?' These words made me reflect. I had no doubt of my mother's tenderness, but knowing the character and way of thinking of my father, I foresaw that my love would not touch him very much, and that he would call it youthful folly. I frankly confessed this to Marta Ivanovna but in spite of this I resolved to write to my father as eloquently as possible to ask his blessing. I showed my letter to Maria Ivanovna, who found it so convincing and touching that she had no doubt of success, and gave herself up to the feeling of her heart with all the confidence of youth and love. I made peace with Shvabrin during the early days of my convalescence. Ivan Kuzmich said to me, reproaching me for the duel, "'You know, Pyotr Andreitch, properly speaking, I ought to put you under arrest, but you are already sufficiently punished without that. As to Alexey Ivanitch, he is confined by my order and under strict guard in the corn magazine, 
and Vasilisa Yegorovna has his sword and her lock and key. He will have time to reflect and repent at his ease. I was too happy to cherish the least rancor. I began to intercede for Schwabrin, and the good commandant, with his wife's leave, agreed to set him at liberty. Schwabrin came to see me. He expressed deep regret for all that had occurred, declared it was all his fault, and begged me to forget the past. Not being of a rancorous disposition, I heartily forgave him both our quarrel and my wound. I saw in his slander the irritation of wounded vanity and rejected love, so I generously forgave my unhappy rival. I was soon completely recovered and was able to get back to my quarters. I impatiently awaited the answer to my letter, but not daring to hope, but trying to stifle sad forebodings that would arise. I had not yet attempted any explanation as regarded Vasilisa Igorovna and her husband, but my courtship could be no surprise to them, as neither Maria nor myself made any secret of our feelings before them, and we were sure beforehand of their consent. At last, one fine day, Savielich came into my room with a letter in his hand. I took it, trembling. The address was written in my father's hand. This prepared me for something serious, since it was usually my mother who wrote, and he only added a few lines at the end. For a long time I could not make up my mind to break the seal. I read over the solemn address. To my son, Pyotr Andreyevich Grinyev, district of Orenburg, Fort Belogorsk. I tried to guess from my father's handwriting in what mood he had written the letter. At last I resolved to open it, and I did not need to read more than the first few lines to see that the whole affair was at the devil. Here are the contents of the letter. My son Pyotr, we received the 15th of this month the letter in which you asked our parental blessing and our consent to your marriage with Maria Ivanovna, the Mironov daughter. And not only have I no intention of giving you either my blessing or my consent, but I intend to come and punish you well for your follies. Like a little boy, in spite of your officer's rank, because you have shown me that you are not fit to wear the sword entrusted to you for the defense of your country, and not for fighting duels with fools like yourself, I shall write immediately to Andrei Karlovitch to beg him to send you away from Fort Belogorsk to some place still further removed, so that you may get over this folly. Upon hearing of your duel and wound, your mother fell ill with sorrow, and she is still confined to her bed. What will become of you? I pray God may correct you, though I scarcely dare trust in his goodness. Your father, A. G. The perusal of this letter aroused in me a medley of feelings. The harsh expressions which my father had not scrupled to make use of hurt me deeply. The contempt which he cast on Maria Ivanovna appeared to me as unjust as it was unseemly. While finally the idea of being sent away from Fort Belogorsk dismayed me, but I was, above all, grieved at my mother's illness. I was disgusted with Savielich, never doubting that it was he who had made known my duel to my parents. After walking up and down a while in my little room, I suddenly stopped short before him and said to him angrily, "'It seems that it did not satisfy you that, thanks to you, I have been wounded and at death's door, but that you must also want to kill my mother as well.' Savielich remained motionless, as if struck by a thunderbolt. "'Have pity on me, sir!' he exclaimed, almost sobbing. "'What is it you deign to tell me, that I am the cause of your wound?' "'But God knows I was only running to stand between you and Alexey Ivanitch's sword. A cursed old age alone prevented me. What have I now done to your mother?' "'What did you do?' I retorted. "'Who told you to write and denounce me? Were you put in my service to be a spy upon me?' "'I denounce you,' replied Savielich in tears. "'Oh, good heavens! Here, be so good as to read what my master has written to me, and see if it was I who denounced you.' With this he drew from his pocket a letter which he offered to me, and I read as follows. "'Shame on you, old dog, for never writing and telling me anything about my son Pyotr Andreitch, in spite of my strict orders, and that it should be from strangers that I learn his follies. Is it thus you do your duty and act up to your master's wishes? I shall send you to keep the pigs, old rascal, for having hid from me the truth, and for your weak compliance with the lad's whims. On receipt of this letter, 
I order you to let me know directly the state of his health, which, judging by what I hear, is improving, and to tell me exactly the place where he was hit, and if the wound be well healed. Evidently Savielich had not been the least to blame, and it was I who had insulted him by my suspicions and reproaches. I begged his pardon, but the old man was inconsolable. "'That I should have lived to see it,' repeated he. "'These be the thanks that I have deserved of my masters for all my long service. I am an old dog. I am only fit to keep pigs. In addition to all this, I am the cause of your wound. No, my father, Pyotr Andreitch, tis not I who am to blame. It is rather the confounded Mulfu. It was he who taught you to fight with those iron spits, stamping your foot as though by ramming and stamping you could defend yourself from a bad man. It was, indeed, worth while spending money on a Mulfu to teach you that. But who could have taken the trouble to tell my father what I had done? The general? He did not seem to trouble himself much about me. And, indeed, Ivan Kuzmich had not thought it necessary to report my duel to him. I could not think. My suspicions fell upon Schwabrin. He alone could profit by this betrayal, which might end in my banishment from the fort and my separation from the commandant's family. I was going to tell all to Marya Ivanovna when she met me on the doorstep. "'What has happened?' she said to me. "'How pale you are!' "'All is at an end,' replied I, handing her my father's letter. In her turn she grew pale. After reading the letter she gave it me back, and said, in a voice broken by emotion, "'It was not my fate. Your parents do not want me in your family. God's will be done. God knows better than we do what is fit for us. And there is nothing to be done, Pyotr Andreitch. May you at least be happy.' "'I shall not be thus.' I exclaimed, seizing her hand. "'You love me. I am ready for anything. Let us go and throw ourselves at your parents' feet. They are honest people, neither proud nor hard. They, they will give us their blessing. We will marry, and then, with time, I am sure we shall succeed in mollifying my father. My mother will intercede for us, and he will forgive me.' "'No, Pyotr Andreitch,' replied Marya. "'I will not marry you without the blessing of your parents. Without their blessing you would not be happy.' Let us submit to the will of God. Should you meet with another betrothed, should you love her, God be with you, Pyotr Andreitch. I, I will pray for you both. She began to cry and went away. I meant to follow her to her room, but I felt unable to control myself, and I went home. I was seated, deep in melancholy reflections, when Savielich suddenly came and interrupted me. Here, sir he said, handing me a sheet of paper all covered with writing. See if I be a spy on my master, and if I try to sow discord betwixt father and son. I took the paper from his hand. It was Savielich's reply to the letter he had received. Here it is, word for word. My lord, Andrei Petrovitch, our gracious father, I have received your gracious letter, in which you deign to be angered with me, your serf, bidding me be ashamed of not obeying my master's orders. And I, who am not an old dog, but your faithful servant, I do obey my master's orders, and I have ever served you zealously, even unto white hairs. I did not write to you about Pyotr Andreitch's wound, in order not to frighten you without cause. And now we hear that our mistress, our mother, Avdotya Vasilyevna, is ill of fright, and I shall go and pray heaven for her health. Pyotr Andreitch has been wounded in the chest— beneath the right shoulder under one rib, to the depth of a verchok and a half, and he has been taken care of in the commandant's house, whither we brought him from the river-bank, and it was the barber here, Stepan Paramonov, who treated him, and now Pyotr Andreitch, thank God, is going on well, and there is nothing but good to tell of him. His superiors, according to hearsay, are well pleased with him, and Vasilisa Igorovna treats him as her own son, and because such an affair should have happened to him, you must not reproach him. The horse may have four legs, and yet stumble, and you deign to write that you will send me to keep the pigs. My lord's will be done, and now I salute you down to the ground. Your faithful serf, Archip Savilyev. I could not help smiling once or twice as I read the good old man's letter. I did not feel equal to writing to my father, and to make my mother easy, the letter of Savielich seemed to me amply sufficient. From this day my position underwent a change. Maria Ivanovna scarcely ever spoke to me, and even tried to avoid me. 
The commandant's house became unbearable to me. Little by little I accustomed myself to stay alone in my quarters. At first Vasilisa Igorna remonstrated, but seeing I persisted in my line of conduct, she left me in peace. I only saw Ivan Kuzmich when military duties brought us in contact. I had only rare interviews with Shrabrin, whom I disliked the more that I thought I perceived him in a secret enmity, which confirmed all the more my suspicions. Life became a burden to me. I gave myself up, a prey to dark melancholy, which was further fed by loneliness and inaction. My love burnt the more hotly for my enforced quiet, and tormented me more and more. I lost all liking for reading and literature. I was allowing myself to be completely cast down, and I dreaded either becoming mad or dissolute when events suddenly occurred, which strongly influenced my life and gave my mind a profound and salutary rousing. End of chapter 5 Recording by Kevin Davidson www.blogordie.com